Hi, and welcome to the Sunday Lunch Project Manager podcast for Sunday, the 4th of August, 2024. This is your host, Nigel Creaser, and today I've got the second part of my interview with Mike Clayton. Hope you enjoy. Bye. So if you're listening to this, that means you've had a week's gap from episode one, part one. Which means that you've had a week where you've been wondering what on earth was going to be said next in the next pieces. Wondering what other nuggets of information were coming from my guest. And you've had a week where you haven't been able to apply those nuggets because you didn't know they existed or what they were. Which is a little bit frustrating really. Because imagine how much more efficient, productive or amazing you could have been. But you know there's a way around it. You know that you can. Pop along to Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Sunday Lunch PM, or to Spotify, have a look at the feed, and there's a little lock. Click on the lock, and it'll ask you to pay. It's price for coffee. That's it. A month, and you'll get everything a week early. Uh, and you won't have bits like this uh, in it with me, which on about becoming a patron and things like that. So, have a think. And anyway, I'll shut up now because you're probably thinking, just get on with it, Nigel. So yeah, here's the uh, the second part of the show. So I have a number of sponsors, affiliate links um, in the way that it's set up um, that have kindly allowed me to uh, um, share their services really. The first one um, is Mike Clayton and Mike runs PM online PM courses and it is a great resource for um, getting those fundamentals of project management uh, trained, reasonably priced uh, and Mike um, presents it in an accessible and um, uh, clear manner. Um, you can check out some of his um, uh, videos on, on his YouTube channel and kind of give you a view of where they are. But um, the, the code for that, if you go to nigelcreaser.com slash online PM courses, all, all one word, lowercase, that'll redirect you to it. Um, there's very different levels that you can um, buy. You can buy individual courses, you can buy pathways as well, if you like. Um, and I get a kickback off those, uh, my kindly. Uh, shares me that so um, if you do jump on and use it I hope you find it really useful Um, I think he has money back guarantees and things like that as well so there's a very limited risk um, on that so uh, jump on that and that again it's nigelcreaser.com slash online pm courses and enjoy Mm. what on the flip side of that what is your biggest screw up in your uh, project management career? And what? Well, and and again, critically, what did you learn? This I mean, you, you learn more from your screw ups than you do from your successes. Yeah. In truth, and and I think the biggest the biggest one in terms of learning, I suppose there were two, but the the one in t- that was really a genuinely a project management screw up rather than a kind of professional uh, screw up was in uh, straight out coming straight out of like a lot of consultants, year 2000 project, I went straight into a, um, uh, a brand new, let's build a web, web based business uh, mm-hmm. project. And it was on incredibly tight timelines. Uh, it was based in Holland and it had a team of about 80 people from our firm. Um, and a lot of other people from other firms as well. But, um, I went out to Holland to be launch director for this new, venture which was at the time owned by Manisman um, but during the process Manisman was bought by Vodafone so it became a Vodafone project and um, it was a huge a huge project huge highly technical highly complex project a great example of a project where I turned up and I had absolutely no idea of any of the technology <laughs> uh, it was over the course of several lunches and dinners with with team leads and experts that I kind of got a sense of how it all fitted together but my my role was really just to 
bring all the different strands, the commercial, the technical, uh, the marketing strands all together into a kind of one project that we could monitor and oversee. It was more program management. But I, I've always wished that in those days, like we do now, I'd had a camera in my pocket because my door, my, I had a so only time I've had an office as a consultant on a client site, an office to myself with us with, with us and my staff. And um, I had a launch director on the door, which I just thought fantastic. I, mean, uh, I just wish I had a button on the desk. Um, but <laughs> I it was it was very stressful. Uh, there was some interesting project politics which we need not go into uh for reasons that have become obvious but i was i felt i was under enormous stress i was working long hours some of the team were local to the netherlands or able to you know reasonable commute to uh, from belgium uh, some were flying in on three weeks on one week off from places like canada the united states malaysia um, but i was flying out on a weekly commute um, getting the first flight out from City Airport, last flight back on a Friday evening. And typically I was getting into the office at seven in the morning in order to try and get some work done before <laughs> things got crazy. And I maxed out my credit card on pizzas um, pretty, by, by you know, buying the best part of 100 pizzas every night at around about 11 o'clock. Um, so that was the kind of crazy thing. And, and it, it was just getting it was just getting crazy and i was under quite a lot of uh, pressure uh, to deliver and there were one or two people who were looking for uh, people to blame frankly uh, for things that weren't going right and not to put too fine a point on it i cracked i just couldn't ha- i couldn't hack it at one point um i went into a bit of a meltdown and uh the stress got to me and for about 24 hours i was not much used to anybody um, and, and luckily, I pulled myself together and we actually delivered uh, in, in, in every way that mattered to the client. Uh, we, we delivered. Um, but it was at that point that I kind of realized I needed to learn a bit about the, the whole stress thing and, and how to avoid this ever happening to me again and, and start to understand what was happening to the people around me as well. Um, which is is fantastic because although I've written four books on project management, I, I am a project manager uh, to my core. Um, my best selling book uh, to date is actually my book on stress management. And and people say, how do you, how does a project manager come to write about stress management, about time, <laughs> about influence? And I say, well, actually, what is a project manager doing every day? If if uh, once you've mastered the technical stuff of planning it's influencing it's it's managing time it's managing your stress so um I, what i really learned there is the importance of looking after yourself and of being able to detect stress in yourself and your team and to bring it back under control before it gets too crazy or if it does get too crazy actually understand what's going on and how to fix it and all of that I learned out of that one experience and a determination that it was never going to happen again to me. Yeah. It happens to people all over the world every day, but yeah. And I, th- I think, um, from a, the project managers and, and, and I bang on about this can be a lonely place, um, mm. as a project manager, because you are, um, given a lot of autonomy, you're given a lot of rope, and uh, you take responsibility for your team. And as you say, you're that um, shield from the organization for your team. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of getting pulled both ways, aren't you? And uh, you're in that middle ground where you're not. Whilst you're representing the organization, you don't have the absolute autonomy to do it how you want to do it. Mm-hmm. But you know that you've got to kind of help your team get it done in spite of the organization sometimes yeah and and spotting your stress triggers is quite difficult um yeah. if you're not paying attention uh, i've been had, had a couple of um uh, points where i've gone through stress related instances the and, and some ex- one extreme case and it was 
uh, it, it scared me because I didn't spot it and I didn't realise. No, and, and I think quite often all of us as PMs, we deal with what's going on and we bottle it all up and we, we you don't take it home to your family. You don't share it with your boss. Yeah. And you kind of, it's just you and your little whirlwind in the middle there trying to be that sea of calm. Um, I mean, I don't know how many analogies I just mixed up. <laughs> um, and, and you're trying to be that sea of calm for everyone. And, and it can, and as you just said there, it can immediately you saying that you're doing uh, flying out first flight on a Monday, last flight on a Friday, immediately my ears prick up and say, that's not very good. Mm. And then, then you say you're doing 7th or 11th, and then immediately you think, well, if you're looking at someone else doing that, you'd be going, hang on a minute, that's probably not the right thing to do, mate. Yeah. But when you're doing it, it's kind of, well, it's just temporary. Yeah. It's just for a bit. But there's also the feeling, I mean, this was, what was this? This would have been uh, about 19 years ago. So I was 19 years younger. And, of course, there is a certain age range when you are still invincible. Um, yeah. You're not, of course, but nobody's going to tell you that. And, of course, th- there is that other thing, that kind of quite macho approach of some of the big consultancies and probably some of the big engineering firms, which is there is an expectation that people will it's you know it's the, you're expected to go the extra mile but what that actually means is is actually run yourself into the ground and uh so i i think there is that whole conspiracy of the company and the expectations and your own ambition and your own sense of self identification as a bit of a hero well, we, there are yeah. project managers that do have that kind of hero complex that sense that uh, I, w- I won't ask my team to do this but i'll do it um, yeah. And of course, then, of course, if you are a good project manager and you have a, a loyal team, the thing you forget is that your team will go out of their way to support you because you've worked hard to build that that, that uh, relationship with them. So you're not expecting them to, to go that extra mile, but sometimes leading from the front is actually dragging people into a bad place. Yeah. Yeah. Because you set the stall, don't you? And, and mm. if you're there from seven till 10 o'clock, mm people around you see that as being the norm yeah and whilst you're seeing it as being an exception for this and it's for me other people tend to think well i should i should be and it and it's not necessarily a an explicit i should be and they may not even realize they feel that but it feels like a um and i i was listening to and, and it's a phrase seth godin uses um a lot around people like us do this yeah and that's what the project you would set that stall, wouldn't you? And you'd be there going, I'm doing this. So they look at you and think, well, that's what we do on this project. Yeah. And and that and it and it and it builds in there as a culture, doesn't it? Without it being explicitly said. And then suddenly you find out, as you say, you're spending thousands of pounds on pizzas. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, which isn't ideal. Yeah. Going back to a more pot whilst actually that 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 whole area of project management and stress is is is, is fascinates me to be quite honest um on uh, how we how we better deal with it and better protect our project managers but going beyond that what what was your proudest project delivery so of all the projects you managed to get over the line buying pizzas for everyone <laughs> whatever it, it needed to be done and getting it over that line and going mm. yes we did that yeah, strangely, it's not the gift set of Domino's pizzas from uh, <laughs> from the pizza company in The Hague. Um, I, it's bizarre because I think there are, uh, A, lots of people who won't nowadays who won't actually recognise this. And, and people who were around at the time wonder whether it was all money well spent. But year 2000, I mean, every big yeah. consultancy had people out there doing it. I, I led the Deloitte contribution to the year 2000 program for uh, BAA PLC which at the time held you know seven of the UK's well I would say six of the UK's largest airports and Southampton um, <laughs> plus airports around the world and, and other, all sorts of other interests and I the, I I took on leadership of that project uh, uh, from, from Deloitte perspective um, in interesting circumstances, let's say, and when it was seen by the firm as a project in serious risk, um, and I was asked to try and stabilise it 
and we didn't just stabilize it we turned it into a huge success uh, commercially for our firm but more importantly and probably the causally uh, a huge success for BAA they you know that it went really smoothly for them um, and given the amount of equipment and the amount of technology that their engineers found that did have potential year 2000 problems uh, the fact that there was you know probably fewer faults on the 1st of January uh, than they would normally expect to uh, deal with um, it was a, it was a huge huge success and I and I think for me it was the first big project I, I got to manage uh, the first time I was working across such a breadth of different activities different types of people um, it's where I really crafted a lot of my understanding of what makes a good project manager what makes a good team um, what makes a good consultancy assignment as well um, so yeah um, and, and it transformed my career as well I, you know my career wasn't going very far very fast uh, up until then I was brought on to that as at the request of the client as it happened um, who'd, who'd met me and thought I really understood what it was they wanted when the team leadership uh, before that point didn't and uh, and and I turned that into the the basis for pretty much everything I've done since wow so really and that the, I was around then I was doing year 2000 projects myself <laughs> within Barclays and um, so and the biggest newsworthy um, I think that that I remember newsworthy year 2000 bug millennium bug problems that people were worried about on the street were the planes falling out of the sky. And that well, was that was the big worry, yeah. or not landing properly. And uh, that, that was yeah, the, that that was British Airways problem. The yeah. planes falling out of the sky. But it's interesting because I. But wanted... if you but if 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 BAA weren't able to let them land, yeah, they'd soon fall out of the sky with no petrol. We know yeah. that from watching Die Hard, don't we? So. <laughs> well, I have to say the the big I, seriously. I think the biggest single risk. Um, in terms of scale of risk, not necessarily potential outcome, uh, because although it would have been a press a publicity nightmare, it, it would, nobody would have got hurt. But actually, the things that we, where there were most uh, engineering concerns found was was the baggage uh, handling yeah. systems. They are so complex. Yeah. But I tell you that that planes falling out of the sky thing. It, it reminds me one of the things I always tell people is, if you're a project manager, is you need to carve time out of your week even if it's only half an hour, to find somewhere quiet and just think and just let all of the things you've heard over the last week, all the concerns, just bubble to the surface. You need a bit of quiet time. And I, I, I created this ritual of marking myself as being in meeting room five because we were working at Gatwick Airport at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my friends, my colleagues, said, we were trying to find you and we discovered there is no meeting room five. <laughs> where are you it's cost of coffee actually but i had the i was sitting there not not really coming up with anything insightful and i heard someone on the phone booking uh an, a ski holiday this was a couple of years out and it suddenly occurred to me that i'd heard in a meeting just that week something that surprised me which is the biggest fly day certainly back then uh for uh, a number of the UK airports is not over the summer. It is the 1st of January oh. because that's when people go on their skiing holidays. And I just thought if I phoned up the airport and said, I'm planning to book a skiing holiday, but I'm worried that it won't be safe because of the millennium bug. I thought, I wonder what they would say. So I went back to the office and I, I used my mobile rather than the office phone. I didn't use the uh, internal directory. I just uh, phone directory inquiries said, I want to speak to Gatwick. So I got, got a phone to Gatwick and I said, to, I just uh, some call handler picked up the phone and I said, I'm you know thinking of flying. And uh, and she went silent because, you know, is, is it going to be safe to fly? And she went silent and then she said, well, I expect it will be, but I wouldn't. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure that that's actually what corporate HQ would want them to be saying. And that kicked off a whole new work stream. And it was just because I'd spent that half an hour not doing anything yeah, that reflective. you know it had a completely new work stream and over the course of uh, six months or so we managed to get everyone trained 
with scripts that were approved by engineering and by legal. And uh, and every quarter we re- reviewed those scripts and revised them as and when we had new information. Or so I think that you know, and it's those little learnings that I had so many of them over the course of what was for me a two and a half year project, and so many different experiences that you know I, I kind of crafted a lot of my understanding there. Yeah, that's it's fascinating that because they it's that that ability to reach beyond the project scope and go, what is the business impact? What is going to happen to the business? Yeah. And as you say there, if um, not picking up that, not spotting that, that point, mm-hmm. and if, if left as it was, obviously BAA, the way they get their money is payments mm. for everyone that goes through the airport. Yeah. And therefore... If on that on their busiest day, yeah, as you say, if that, it's like it's like um, New Year's Eve at uh, anywhere that sells in Christmas presents for blokes to buy for their wives. Yeah, They're, that's their biggest day, isn't it? So yeah. not spotting that makes a massive business impact, not just the project tick the box. We've delivered the project. Yeah, moving kind of slightly different angle on on your own achievements. Yeah, and thinking about what your proudest project achievement was not necessarily related to the delivery Mm. but something that wasn't about yes we made that project go live what during your course of being the pm on these pieces of work what is the thing that you found that made you giving you the most pride Hmm. yeah i I once told a story uh, and I just kind of publicised a bit of it uh, on social media and I didn't actually say what the story was, but I, I kind of attributed the success I had to one of my former colleagues and he, he emailed me and said, I have no idea what I've said to you that you felt was so influential, but it was a chap called Rex McCrill who I think now um, is uh, very successful uh, executive coach and he and I were had kind of had fairly parallel trajectories at Deloitte and he was at the time had started running a project for I think for the Ministry of Defence somewhat before I'd moved on to uh, the project I was doing and we met up and one of the things he said is now you're running a good project you've got a real responsibility to do something with that success don't just kind of bank the success but actually you've got a stable successful project do do good um and shortly after that conversation i got a phone call from uh the resourcing people so at deloitte and i guess all the big consultancies you need a resource you ask uh, the resourcing people to find you someone to fit a uh, a template uh, mm-hmm. in terms of seniority, experience, expertise, whatever. And so I put in my request and they phoned up and said, we've got someone, but I have to say, you know, um, he's not well liked. <laughs> um, he has, you know, a number of his assignment managers feel that he's let them down, whatever. And so we're going to be asking you to keep an eye on him and because um, this is his last chance. <laughs> And I, and my heart sank for a moment. I thought, okay, well, let's, let's see what. I said, so the guy turned, and I, I sat him down and I said, look, I don't know if you know, but you come with a health warning. And, and he said, mm, I'm not really surprised about that. And uh, I said, look, cards on the table. This is, this is what I've been told. Um, so you've got a choice. If you carry on like that, you won't be on this project for much longer. And I'm fairly sure this will be your last project. But if you say to me now you want to change that perception, I will help you to change that perception. I will help you to do a good job and I will therefore be able to say in good faith that you've done a good job and we can start to turn this all around. And he said that's what he wants here, he, you know, and we um the great thing was that when he rolled off that project, he was the only team member on that entire project who got a letter of thanks from the client. So that made me enormously proud. Partly it made me proud of him. And if I'm 
absolutely brutally honest about it partly it made me proud that i actually did the right thing when it would have been actually much easier to say well, i'll wait i'll get someone else um, but i didn't and so i'm kind of proud of myself as well but the principle works and that's you know and you know, all credit to rex for kind of pointing out to me that we we can do that as as successful project managers if we create some space on our projects we can start to invest in our people or um or whatever else needs needs our investment absolutely i think that's a, it's, a, it's absolutely spot on um moving now through we've kind of gone covered the the history of of your project management and i know that obviously you're doing other things now um and uh looking on your website there's a, a whole raft of it so what made you move away from the delivery of project management and then into the the other roles and setting up your own business and um, the books, the speaking, blogging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's, um, it all comes down to philosophy of the, around the work I was doing. As we kind of came towards the end of the nineties into the early 20th, 21st century, um, I was very clearly with a number of other colleagues at Deloitte's, kind of mentally aligned to the idea of integrating two of our service lines. We had a service line which we called program leadership, which was project to program management and all the good things that you and I know how to do. And there was another service line which was called change leadership or which was the management of change, uh, all the softer skills. And and I had come firmly to the conclusion, as had a number of my colleagues um, on both sides of that, divide of, between two service lines that actually we were really talking about two ends of a spectrum rather than two distinct disciplines mm -hmm. and that you can't be successful in delivering change unless you can manage a project and you can't be delivering a successful successfully deliver a project unless you can manage the change aspects of it and you have to be able to play across the whole spectrum and sure there are always going to be people who are going to be most comfortable at one end of the spectrum or the other um, but i saw it as being very much what i think thought we should be doing to um to bring those two services and lines together integrate them more closely um but around the you know 2001 2002 it was quite clear that deloitte at that time saw their future uh, or their immediate future in enterprise resource planning ERP implementations in uh, I, big IT implementations using those tools plus all the web tools. And the, the message they were getting from their clients was they wanted project managers who could make technology projects work and they weren't interested in all the soft side of it. They just wanted the kit to work. And, and I was earmarked as one of the project managers who would be very, very capable at delivering that stuff albeit not a technologist um, and that's what the firm wanted me to do it wasn't what I wanted to be doing and and interestingly having had conversations that's pretty much the way the firm and I suspect pretty much all of the the big consultants have moved is much closer integration of those disciplines because it mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. um, but it was it wasn't right for me to stay on the terms they wanted me to stay on and, and the, you know weren't weren't right so uh I, I felt i had to leave and and having made the decision that i wasn't going to stay on i also made the decision not to stay on doing project management i loved doing training i'd, I'd trained project managers at Deloitte for a no good number of years i'd done all the kind of landmark training for the big promotions that people got i was involved in tr those training courses uh internationally um so i wanted to get involved in training so that's how i how i came to kind of set myself up as an independent trainer and start pretty much from nothing all right that must have been an exciting project <laughs> uh, a pretty hairy one i mean it was it was <laughs> six, it was six months before i actually you know won my first engagement and uh and i kind of used the promise of my first uh first income to uh to buy the laptop i'd need to uh, uh to project the slides from so it was yeah it was it was an interesting that period yeah. but you know i learned that i learned the art and craft of cold calling uh which is something mm -hmm. i never want to go back to 
but uh <laughs> yeah you you do what you need to do and um you know my business grew from there brilliant i've got a few final questions but okay. before we go into that one the the, 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 the sort of last flow out that i have there what what are you something i i need to write it higher up in me uh um interview things is what do you do when you're not teaching people to project managing project managing you mean what else am i teaching them or uh, what do i do when i'm not te- when i'm not working when you're not working <laughs> yeah yeah uh, what do you do working it's mostly it's mostly a family but i'll tell you the thing that i've been doing most of uh work wise over the last few years is is putting my training courses onto video and i have become a bit of a uh hobbyist uh, film editor and nice. started to get into motion graphics as well um, so uh, that's actually uh, quite fun and and you know playing around with uh, video equipment and learning how to edit videos and stuff that's uh, that's occupying quite a lot of my time as well um but yeah uh, you've got you've got a couple of daughters it <laughs> they're pretty you know, at that age they're pretty all consuming i think she's starting to get to the age where uh, I can get a bit more time to myself and my wife can get a bit more time to herself, but uh, still uh, still a big, big draw on our time. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. What was the last project, the podcast that you listened to? Yeah, the last one I listened to uh, was uh, you and uh, Peter Taylor, because I saw him there and I thought, oh, he's always been entertaining. I'll have a listen, <laughs> get his story. <laughs> Yeah, with his uh, yeah, especially with his he's got his ten year anniversary this year, isn't he, with the book mm-hmm. um, as well. So I think uh, yeah, he's he's always entertaining. And what about the last project blog? What do you read? Um, at the moment, actually, I must confess, I tend to write far more than I read. Yeah. Um, <laughs> finally, I I, um, I read quite a lot of not blogs, but uh, I rushed out a, a blog. Uh, just yesterday uh, about the new PMP exam uh, that was, uh, PMP announced a week or so ago um, and that that required me to uh, and funnily enough I think I may not be the first person to blog on it but I couldn't find anyone else so um, so because I, I, I was looking for that but I tend to um, I'm gonna forget the chap's name now uh, it's gonna annoy Dave Gordon produces a digest of um, right. of blogs every week uh, and he, I don't know how he does it. Amazing. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's usually about 20 really good quality blogs that he's found and has summarized in one sentence. And I just kind of browse that every week um, looking for one or two uh, that attract me. Uh, so I'm not a kind of faithful reader of any particular blogs, although interestingly, I'm. Uh, starting to i'm starting to think of a kind of little pl- project around other people's blogs um that i can i can start for my my own audience uh, but yes yeah, so i just i i've no idea what the last one of his i think probably the last one i yes i do remember um uh that i did relatively recently this isn't the last one but the one that stuck in my mind was again uh, a very kind of uh, high power agilist uh talking about how he's been appointed to the uh, uh to the to le- help lead the team that's going to produce the next pinbock and saying that's going to be a very different beast uh mm-hmm. to uh the current one so anyone uh, any any uh pmps out there um it agile is going to be a much bigger thing for um for the PMI. Yeah, well, yeah, it makes sense. It's another tool that we're using and it's used extensively, isn't it? So Yeah. Um and and I think it's um uh, as we discussed earlier, it's it's a good hammer. Yeah. Uh, when you're hammering in a nail. Yeah. My only problem is it's not a hammer I I learned to use while I was actively managing projects because it didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Although I do take issue with agilists saying, "Well, this is all new." Um, we 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 were doing we were doing incremental and iterative stuff back in the nineties, and I'm sure. Yeah, Rob. I'm sure Rupp. the pyramids yeah, weren't it? built in one go. No, was it rational rows and all that stuff was around yeah. then, wasn't it? And uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even even yeah. just in traditional predictive project management we still wouldn't we would still aim to release our project in chunks and review as we went so um i probably know more agile than i think i do i think if i probably examine it it's it's an overlay of uh, techniques and methodologies around quite a familiar familiar ground 
yeah, from right. my my experience of it, and and the training has been my main experience with a little bit of trying to apply apply it, and it is um, I find it um really really good mm. when applied to the right thing. I think yeah. it's yeah. So on that, just thinking about the last couple of questions here is what would be the top tip that you'd give to a seasoned project manager out there? Um, just that one tip to someone who's been 10, 20, 10, 15 years in project management. <laughs> what, what would you, what would you say to them? Yeah, when you asked me uh, to do this and you gave me some hints about some of the questions you might ask and you hinted that you'd ask this. Um, and actually in my mind, I was going to talk about servant leadership and we'd, you'd be blown that one out of the water. So um, <laughs> the, the, the one rule that I always tell people starting out but i think we need to remember it as seasons project managers is that it's your stakeholders that will determine the outcome of your project not in terms of what happens but how it's perceived and therefore whether it's a success or not um, you can you can build everything you promised to build and you can build it as well or better than you committed to building it you can bring it in on time and under budget but if your stakeholders don't like it it's a failure and so it's not it's not a, a tip in terms of giving people advice they've never heard before it's a urgent reminder <clears throat> that you are never giving enough time to engaging respectfully with your stakeholders uh, so that i think we're going to go with that one given that we've done servant leadership's death fair enough fair enough and the final question of of, of the day what would you tell young dr mike when he's just stepped into that first project <laughs> um on that first day in project management at where was it i'm trying to remember i've got it written down can't congestion charge, wanna... isn't it no no, that wasn't no, the first one. <laughs> no the local authority one sorry right, the one yeah. Next, yeah. yeah 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 so in that property developers and you you've gone down there your first day with your your bright sh clean shiny project book and your shiny shoes and briefcase i guess back at back of the day mm. what what would you say to mike actually i'll probably say two things i think there's, there's one thing i did well which i think i sh i should have done well and i would 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 say to myself anyway which is to use your project management experiences as a platform for learning um for learning about all sorts of different disciplines like stress management like time management like influence and communication and all of the different skills which aren't strictly speaking project management skills but without which we cannot manage a project yeah. the the thing that i would that i didn't do well uh, nearly as well as i could or should have done which is also to use project management as a platform for building a network really and truly uh i got on with the projects and i delivered the projects and i engaged with stakeholders purely around the project and therefore didn't take nearly enough of those relationships uh, on beyond um, beyond the duration of the project which is a, a matter of some regret um, so that those those would be my two actually I'm going to give you a bonus because <laughs> we talk about Pinbox 7 coming out I mean I when I got I don't know if you you're PMP if you've yeah, read yeah, yeah. but you know I got Pinbox 6 in a post and it's just this massive great thing the one tip I would say absolutely to the younger mike which i'm afraid is not a tip that's available to uh, to any new project managers listening although it probably is just as valid is get your pmp in now because if i'd have done my pmp in 1996 when i got the first edition of the pinbock uh it had i still got it uh still got it on my desk it's 174 pages and it makes sense and it's printed on white paper um you know so if you're a, if you're a project manager now and you're thinking about doing your pmp because you know you see a career ahead of you do it now it's only about 600 pages by the time you're my age it will probably be about 900 pages and it will be only available plugging straight into your brain yeah <laughs> so yeah, i know i think it was 2002 when i did mine so i'm glad i did it I back then. Finished, i guess yeah yeah something like that yeah um well that that is my questions that's everything that i was uh, planning to ask and more 
if people um, want to get in touch, catch up, grab one of your books, get in touch with you some of your training, what's the best way for people to get hold of you? Okay, if they're interested in project management, as your audience are, uh, the place to go is online pmcourses.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I sell all sorts of project management courses there. My own uh, core courses for people who need to do traditional plan project management. I sell soft skills courses that are relevant to project managers like uh, managing change and delegating leadership. Uh, but I also uh, have uh, certification courses for things like PMP and Scrum uh, as well on there. Uh, there's Agile courses too. Um, and lots of free stuff as well. There's a, a weekly a weekly article, which is a big read um, and may not be right for people with lots and lots of experience and knowledge, but certainly for uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good stuff there. Attached to that, there's the YouTube channel. I, I do videos every week on YouTube. Um, look out for online PM courses on YouTube as well. And all the usual channels, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm always happy to uh, connect with people. And if you're a member of the Association for Project Management APM here in the UK, then look out for my article in every quarterly edition. Uh, you'll find a, uh, a one-page thought piece from me. And I think the summer edition must be out fairly soon. All right. Cool. That's brilliant. Finally, then, thank you, Mike, for your time and your uh, uh, interesting and entertaining stories. There's some fan- fascinating stuff in there. And um, have a wonderful evening. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for hosting me. No problem. Thanks, Mike. Cheers, then. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Many thanks to Mike for a great interview. And if you know anyone who would like to be uh, interviewed, uh, whether it be for one of these interview uh, podcasts or for one of the Saturday brunch uh, shorter versions, then get them to ping me a message at Sunday Lunch PM Pod at nigelcreaser.com. If you've got questions and comments or whatever, um, ping me to the same address or grab me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all with the handle Sunday Lunch PM. And if you'd like to support the show, as ever, you can. Ping it out to your friends and colleagues and tell them all about it and how wonderful it is. Give me a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to. Buy a copy of one of the books um, or just pop along to Patreon and you can support us there. But obviously, I say it every month, but the most important thing is for you guys to come back uh, and carry on listening. Um, I hope you enjoy it. And remember... Hashtag project management is funny. Well, it's goodbye from me, Nigel Creaser, and it's goodbye from him, the Sunday Lunch PM. Goodbye. Another great sponsor of the show comes in the form of Air Manual. Um, Air Manual is a well, it's a tool for documenting process, which um, and best practices. Um, uh, it's run. It's, it's a company formed by guy, one of my uh, interviewees, uh, Alexis Kingsbury. Um, essentially, uh, and, I, and I kind of summarised why uh, my view of where we see documentation a lot. Of my experience has been people will document something, a process. They'll put it in a, a Visio diagram that gets loaded onto a SharePoint site or something similar. And then a bunch of pro- that. So then, once that, that diagram has been shared with senior management, they're happy. They have a process in the business. But then the, the detailed procedures underneath it might be in Word documents, in, uh, just poorly kept and not linked easily and not updated. And what Air Manual does, it allows you to put in a. It's a tool for doing this kind of thing. You whack it in. Uh, the service in there, get in there, put in your process, your flow, and you build it down to as low a level of detail, even to the point of checklists where people check off they've done it. So it creates that um, uh, guided checklists, um, easy to create, easy to maintain, and all in one place. And no one's kind of rooting around to find the SharePoint, and then when you change to new SharePoint services and all that stuff, it's all there. So if you pop along to nigelcreaser.com slash airmanual, 
Um, there's a bit more detail there and a link there to click on to um, go and get. I think uh, they offer a trial and things like that. So uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's something that I think uh, can easily um, reduce the amount of errors, rework, etc. within our organisation. So um, yeah, take a look. Well, I know you will have enjoyed that second part of that interview. Come back next week. Um, I've got a few more rerun interviews over the next few weeks. Uh, speak to you then. Bye. So this is my final wrap up. Every week you're going to hear this. You're going to get bored of it, but you can always click next podcast if so. Um, if you have enjoyed it, if you've listened to this podcast to the end of this uh, show and you think that was great, I'd love to be able to help Nigel out. Um, there are loads of ways you can do it. Um, the, the first and, and obvious way is to um, share the podcast, send it out to people. Um, if you if you know colleagues and friends who'd benefit from it, you think they'd enjoy it, just send them the link. Grab one of the links send, or send them to www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. That's ni- www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. And that will push them over to a, um, a link tree link. And it's got all of the different ways they can consume the, the podcast. Uh, if you are feeling generous and have a big bag of cash, you could grab a copy of one of my books. Obviously, um, uh, they're available in all the usual places, and print and, and, and digital. Again, jump on the website, uh, www.nigelcreaser.com slash shop, and that will give you a list of all the different ways that you can contribute um, and, and grab copies of the book. Also got um, links to all my guests' books on there as well, where I get a little bit of a kickback from them. Um, if you are of a sporting mind, um, I have a number through doing some of my uh, judo and, and running uh, antics. Uh, I've managed to secure a few um, uh, affiliate links and affiliates uh, there as well. So in there, somewhere in the sponsors page, there's links to those as well. So clicking onto those and grabbing uh, your if you're with it if you're looking to uh, get super fit, then that would be fabulous as well. And I get a little kickback from those. Uh, I have a Patreon account. It's patreon.com slash Sunday Lunch PM. Uh, so again, you can ping something in there, buy me a coffee or whatever. And finally, obviously the most important is coming back. Coming back, listen again. Um, because uh, the more of you that come back, uh, the more uh, visibility I get because there's more times that it's downloaded and all the SEO works and things like that. So yeah, that's it. So uh, if you can help me out, I would be much appreciated. If you can't, don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Cheers now. Bye. Uh, my latest, uh, the, the, the latest uh, affiliate that I've got on the show now is Riverside. Um, I use Riverside to do my interviews in Riverside FM. Um, <clears throat> it kind of offers you a whole if you like, micro studio management producer tooling and, and, and goes beyond that. Has a really good free layer. <clears throat> and I, um, I've i been using it for a while now. I find it really good. When I've had issues, even though I'm not on one of the higher paid levels, the support has been quick, responsive and, and, and of high quality and, and people keen to help me. Uh, the organisation seems really good. The product seems really intuitive. Um, and uh, quality is really good as well. And they, it's, it's a clever way of doing it is when you're, you're recording through your browsers, so you've not got loads of desktop resources being used compared to some other products that I've used. Um, and what they also do is they do a, um, they stream a, a lower quality version of it up onto uh, as you're doing the interview, so you're not burning bandwidth while you're doing the interview and potentially uh, impacting on the quality of the conversation. Uh, and then at the end, it uploads it, uh, the, the higher quality from your browser. Um, I mean, it, it's just a really good way of doing it. So um, if you are um, thinking of doing a podcast and you're supposed to do a podcast, I, I would recommend using this tool. I find it really good. Best, best of the tools that I've tried using 
um, select and you can get that nigelcreaser.com slash riverside and that will redirect you to uh, my kickback page uh, on their site and there I will get a little kickback uh, from them so um, take a look thanks well it's goodbye from me Nigel Creaser and it's goodbye from him the Sunday lunch PM goodbye